Today, I, I do not suffer, but I suffered a lot at that time. And beating yourself, that hurts a thousand times as much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. My guest this week is a man who held one of the most influential jobs in motorsport for more than 20 years. As the boss of Mercedes-Benz Motorsport, he oversaw all of the company's racing activities, the pinnacle of which was Formula One. I'm talking, of course, about Norbert Haug, who was at one stage a regular on the podium alongside the likes of Mika Hakkinen and Lewis Hamilton. Norbert was in charge during a fascinating period for the three-pointed star because it was on his watch that Mercedes returned to Formula One for the first time since 1955. Remember those concept by Mercedes-Benz badges on the side of the 1993 Sauber? Yes, that was Norbert. Then there was the move to McLaren for 1995 and all of the success that followed with the likes of Hakkinen, Hamilton, Coulthard and Raikkonen. And Norbert's final deal before stepping down was the purchase of Braun Grand Prix and the return of the Mercedes-Benz Works team with Michael Schumacher at the helm. And the great thing for us is that many moons ago, Norbert used to be a journalist. He knows how to tell a good story and he has a great memory, so all of the anecdotes are right there ready to be told. We discussed the highs and the lows of his time in charge, including that tumultuous season in 2007, and we get his thoughts on the recent run of success that Mercedes have been on. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Norbert, it's lovely to see you. You don't look a day older from when I last saw you. First of all, we're, we're talking via Zoom. Where are you? How are you? Well, I'm absolutely fine. Well, it, it, it took me about eight years uh, to recover from 22 years of motor racing in Formula One. I'm advising some, uh, some companies. I'm helping some young drivers in the background, supporting a small uh, GT series for young drivers, for amateurs called GTC Race. Helping a friend who is developing a steer by wire system. Jeff Laparavan is the name. Uh, they will also be in DTM this year. So, a little bit 5% racing, 95% uh, out of business. You led Mercedes motorsport activities for more than 20 years. So when you look at their current run of form, seven consecutive constructors' titles, what do you make of that? Well, first of all, it makes me proud. I, I, I was there when we were doing our first steps into Formula One in the 90s. Then our cooperation with McLaren, which was fantastic. I think that was a, a really great uh, time with Ron and, and all the guys. I, I mean, lots of people probably have some criticism about Ron and so on. But I have to say what he did for Formula One and what he did for uh, the teams getting the money, the negotiations with Bernie and so on, commercial rights order, uh, that was that was uh, fantastic. And I had a very, very good cooperation. Uh, and this is not PR speak. This is, uh, we, we, we have been very close friends. It was 15 years. And of course, then uh, having their own Mercedes Works team was another Another step is sheer pure silver arrows. We had silver arrows in McLaren as well and had a great time with, with Mika, with David, with Lewis Hamilton winning his first championship with McLaren Mercedes. So there's a lot of, of legacy. And uh, when, I, when I was pushing for having that works team, having these uh, silver arrows, I mean, I never dreamed of the possibility of winning whatever. I mean, I even cannot count them in the meantime, the eight world championships, seven, whatever. Uh, it's unbelievable. Great job. I'm very happy for the guys. I mean, to win one world championship, Tom, you know how difficult that is, but to repeat it and repeat it and again and again, that is something very, very special. And, uh, you know, I'm also very much against the fact when people say, well, Mercedes makes it boring. It's quite the other way around. You know, the guys that cannot catch up are responsible for. I mean, you cannot you cannot go slower slower at the head of the field. That makes no sense. And so, chapeau, compliments to all the team, to all the guys at Rixworth. It's fantastic. The decision to have your own team has been vindicated many, many times over. 
But how big a decision, how brave a decision was it back in 2009? Because remember, we just had the financial crisis. Uh, Honda had pulled out at the end of 2008. BMW, Toyota pulling out at the end of 2009. And at exactly that time, you thought, no, no, we're going to do the opposite. We are going to invest and have our own team. Yeah, well, that was, I mean, everybody was pulling out and we, and we were entering officially um, it was a very good opportunity, and I think, well, maybe Lady Luck was a little bit on our side. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know how it all started. Ross came to me, and I, I heard from friends that told me he spoke in a po podcast as well about that, how we negotiated and how we did the deal. And you know, Ross was looking for an engine for the next year. We could make that happen together with Martin Wibmarsh. Um, we had a good support from Ron in the in the at, at, uh, from Ross at that time. So this was the starting point. And of course, what Ross knew at that stage was that they will be very, very competitive. I mean, nobody took Honda that seriously in, in, in these days, but he knew that he had a very, very special car. And I mean, I think that was December, the decision. Imagine today. You put the engine in from day one in testing, you are, you are the benchmark. So that was really something special. And the first races uh, were, well, they were quite, quite dominant. And this double diffuser saga, uh, towards the end of the season, it got close with, with Red Bull, obviously. But I mean, they did a great job in, in Braun GP. And of course, we, we got closer and closer. And our plan was to really continue with McLaren, you know that. There were negotiations. This is this is officially stated as well, but we just couldn't find a, a common way, which is a shame. I would have loved to continue, but Mercedes wanted to do a further step, kind of uh, works team, and not. I mean, in these days, uh, probably people do not remember, but it was it was very common that you had an engine partnership. It was Williams BMW, it was McLaren Mercedes. Then Honda ended as works team. They were not very successful. That was the Braun GP. And uh, we had a good opportunity because uh, Ross and Nick Fry, they knew they could not go for on, on, on their own for years and years and years. So they, they looked for a partner and then we could make it happen. It was some discussions in Stuttgart, obviously but not a very long period of time. And uh, I had to present the idea. And, you know, it was not, a, it is not a surprise that the head of motorsports says, well, we go Formula One and, uh, well, let's have the Silver Arrows own team. But without the push of the board members, I can make the proposal, but they need to agree on it. Now, this was obviously a very good step. We did not have a good budget at the beginning. Uh, this was this uh, resource restrictions. They were basically agreed, but uh, more on the paper than in practical terms. And so it was a difficult start. But anyway, I um, mean, uh, 2012, as you know, uh, we won the first race with Nico. And uh, Michael was uh, in his last year in Formula One pole time in Monaco. So there were some highlights as well. Just to clarify then, so, so obviously you did the deal with Braun, but did you negotiate with McLaren about taking over McLaren at that time? Yeah, I cannot go in details because this is all agreed that uh, we wanted to do, let's describe it that way, a step forward. And it was a mutual agreement that we could not come to a, to a solution. But I mean, we are. I think we are still great partners and we have a great heritage together. Things have changed in McLaren as well, but I think we, you can see it the other way around, Tom. I mean, a partnership that lasts 15 years or my time, you know, I was asked, yeah, you are leaving now, and that, but 22 years, 22 and a half years to be precise. I mean, this is quite a long period of time traveling Formula One, but I loved, I loved what I did and I'm happy that our common idea is developing in such a fantastic way. This development, what the team made out of it, is just fantastic and puts a smile on my face. Norbert certainly knows a thing or two about the big business of motorsport, but we've all got to start somewhere. And he didn't get to such a top position in Formula One without making some smart decisions along the way. Back in 2012, SumUp was founded with one goal in mind, to create a world where small businesses can be successful doing what they love. 
And today, more than 3 million businesses use SumUp to get paid. SumUp offers affordable and simple payment tools for businesses which are starting up or levelling up with their excellent range of card readers. Receiving a card reader is often a major milestone for new businesses as they are able to step away from cash-only payments. SumUp sent me one of their card readers to have a play around with, and I'm really impressed with how slick it is. The whole setup was quick as a flash from the box to downloading their app and testing out my first payment. The thing is, I only wish I had something to sell. It's incredibly portable, no bigger than the palm of your hand, and they even include some handy decals for you to proudly display that you're now taking cashless payments, which is a nice touch. SumUp provides the simplest and most affordable range of payments and financial tools. There's no contract, no hidden fees, just easy, flexible payments. And as a small business, what more could you ask for? SumUp. Make your business official. Go to www.sumup.co.uk. That's sumup.co.uk to find out more. Norbert, the works team eventually comes in 2010, but let's wind the clock back now because when you joined Mercedes in 1990, they were dominating sports cars and everybody back then expected them to come into Formula One with their own works team. You'll remember better than anyone the concept by Mercedes-Benz on the side of the 1993 Sauber. Why did that not happen in the end? First of all, it was strictly forbidden from the big bosses in, in uh, Möhringen. They were not so, uh, let's say, the biggest Formula One fans, of course, at that time. And Jürgen Hubert did a fantastic job in really realizing we need to do something on that front. I mean, the image of Mercedes was, was absolutely perfect and good, and, and cars are brilliant, the cars are good, but are they... Are they young? Are they sexy? Are they, are they sporty? And on and, and, and that side, something needs to be done with the um, Mercedes 190. You remember the DTM cars, the Evo 2 and so. Iconic cars in the meantime. And so the whole, the whole idea was also heading towards AMG. Hans-Werner Auche, Aufrecht was the founder, is the founder of AMG. The company was privately owned at that stage. At the end of the 90s, AMG was part of Mercedes and is still then in the product portfolio. And it was really Jürgen Hubert who made the things happen. And so as there was no official go, it was him. It was not the motorsports uh, bus uh, inventing the idea. Then we call it concept by Mercedes. And it was, I was first of all, what concept by Mercedes? Why? And they said, well, let's do it that way, so and so and so. And of course, a very important step was Mario Ilian and uh, Paul Morgan, the late Paul Morgan, who came via Helmut Werner, who was uh, CEO of Mercedes-Benz at that time, partner of, of Jürgen Hubert. And Roger Penske played a, a vital part. He was a, a co-owner in Elmore. And so we, we, we put things together. There was a 10-cylinder engine in place, as you remember, 3.5 liter uh, for Leighton House. But uh, this team, uh, there, was, there was a financial scandal, whatever. And so we, we came together and said, could we use this engine? Could we further develop this engine? Could we go a step ahead together? And this was, uh, in fact, we were at the beginning of 1993. The first race is Carl Wendlinger, J.J. Lechto. The car was really quick. I mean, this was, a, this was a good level. We had a good level, a good group of people. I think maybe this is something for you. Whether there were any new teams since then entering on a, on a comparable level, I think we scored two points or we were fifth or, uh, and, uh, in the first race. So that the basis was, was quite a good one. A very nice car from Harvey Posen's way, Leo Rest. Beautiful car. Yeah. Beautiful car. That Sauber C12, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, the basic concept was that we need to have a fully financed a team that we could uh, fly the engine and then and some probably uh, some money for the driver retainers. As I said, this was an engine partnership. We could not uh, and would not know way that uh, everything was uh, completely financed by Mercedes. So and that's, that, that's why it is a shame it could not have been further developed. But of course, there were other teams knocking on our door. But uh, 
it was was not 92 and star. I mean, there are some rumors going around that Norbert Haug looked for new partners, 92. And so I think that is not correct. We were together and we were approached later on. And of course, I was asked from the board what could be alternatives. But we were youngsters in Formula One at that stage. And were budgets back then between sports cars and Formula One still just a completely different level? Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the engine that was developed in Under Turkheim, the uh, 12 cylinder engine at that time, cost quite a, a few Denmarks at that stage, not Euros. But uh, I think the basic plan when I came was to enter Formula One with that engine. But this was not practical at the end of the day. The Ilma idea was the better one. And then there was a takeover of Ilmore step by step. You know, you know, this is all in the history books. Who approached who? Did McLaren approach you or you approached McLaren? First of all, I knew Ron from being a journalist before. And uh, I don't know whether he at one stage said, hey, what are, what are you guys doing? And uh, let's do it in a different way or what is. You know, he was at that stage, stage with Peugeot, Formula One. I'm not quite sure, but you know Ron. I mean, Ron was always very, very active and uh, he, he did a lot of, of, of good things in, in Formula One, no doubt about that. So how would you sum up those 15 years with McLaren? What was it? 78 wins, three drivers' titles, the Constructors' title in 98. A fair return? 78 wins? I, I did not realise that. Well, that's it not so bad. <laughs> I think we had some near misses, really. We had some, uh, well, remember 2007, the first almost world championship for Lewis with our problem in China. But uh, I mean, that was so hurtful to start at the end when you see that you are 70 points ahead and 20 are still on the market. So two races to go, three, if you, if you get three points, you have got it in your pocket when we still... Uh, missed it. That was really, really hurtful. I mean, that was hurtful for me, for everybody. I'm sure for, for Lewis, because it was his, his first year in, in Formula One. And uh, Lewis ended Formula One in 2007 and was the first nine races, nine times on the podium. That were, and, then, and then came no Nürburgring with a technical problem in, in, uh, in, during qualifying. But nine races, nine podiums. And I, I think the sixth or seventh race in Canada, he won. That was really impressive. While we're talking about drivers then, who was the fastest driver to race for McLaren Mercedes in your time? Oh, it is difficult to judge. I, I think we had a lot of really, really, really good fast drivers. I mean, Mika was very, very special, as you know, in some qualifying. And I mean, if you need to fight it out with Michael Schumacher in Suzuka, that is not easy. Or in the year 2000, remember the... The spa maneuver. Imagine this would have happened with uh, DRS. Nobody would have mentioned it. But I mean, do it that, uh, trying that two times in a row. And I mean, Michael was not so nice to him at the first uh, effort on the long straight. And uh, then Mika doing it again and overtaking Ricardo Sonda. I mean, this is this is an all-time scenery in, in, in Formula One. I mean, if you put that in a movie, nobody, nobody would believe it. So Mika was very special. And I tell you, David Coulthard in, on his day was unbelievable sometimes. I mean, he was once he was in Australia, I remember, and it was starting with rain. And everybody was really down because we didn't have a good qualifying and so on. And we were, we were quite good in Australia. We won in 80, 98, 99 and so on. And I think it was 2001 or so. And I remember saying to David, today anything can happen. You can win. And David was like, yeah, yeah the positive law. But he was the only and then. But I remember he was that later on, on the rostrum. You can ask him. And he was remembering and pointing to me and said, yeah. And David himself describes him very often. Well, wasn't not quite as fast as Mika was. And so, but I tell you, at some occasions... And if you have the measure of Mika, that means something special. Then, of course, Lewis. I mean, Lewis had some 
fantastic races once in uh, in Silverstone in the rain, if you remember. I think it was more than a minute ahead of the second place. Nick Hyde fell. 2008, yep. And then uh, also Fuji was a great race when uh, Fettel had an accident in uh, the Toro Rosso, I remember. And Lewis was very special there. And this was just before the Chinese Grand Prix where we then threw it away. And uh, yeah, uh, the fastest, well, the most successful, of course, is Lewis. Mika would have deserved more because we had some failures here and there. I mean, the cars were not as bulletproof as they are today, of course. But all in all, it was, it was a great period of time. I mean, the McLaren days were fantastic. The sound was sensational of the cars. And the fighting with Michael in a Ferrari, this was a classical battle over years and years. So I enjoyed it very much. It was lots of driving, lots of stress, but we really, we really loved what we did. And I mean, otherwise, you know that otherwise you cannot get the job done anyway. Dealing with Mika for a bit longer, how did his accident in Adelaide 95 change him as a driver, do you think? Well, that, that looked very bad at the beginning uh, in 95. And I, I was I was really, really shocked. This was, was in our first year, the last race of the first year, together with McLaren. We were Marlboro colors, red and white at that stage. It was shocking for us. But we had then, later on, I think in early February or so, we had a first test in Paul Ricard, a secret test. He got into it very, very quickly again, and uh, he recovered very, very good. Still suffered a little bit, but uh, thanks God that uh, went in the, in the right direction. Didn't slow him down, did it? No, obviously not. I mean, he won two world championships at the year uh, in, uh, yeah, after that. And, you know, the year 2000, he was close to, to getting the third one. And it yeah, was more us than him doing a, a mistake and missing it. But... It is what it is, and it was a fantastic period of time. Very much loved it. Was Mika quicker than Kimi Raikkonen? I think, Tom, honestly, uh, if somebody gives you a black and white answer, he's just not telling the truth. I mean, if you if you do not have both guys, uh, com- uh, to com- even then it's, it's difficult. If you have it at the same time, in the same car, in the same team, in the same year, but uh, the raw speed of Kimi, uh, when, he, when he came, with no experience at all into Formula 1, remember, in 2001 in, in Australia. I mean, he, he was one of the guys at the split times, or the, or the only guy. You all, the whole race long, you saw green times. So green time, as you know, this lap is quicker than the lap before. And not, not because he was so, so slow at the beginning. He was learning in racing speed. He was getting quicker and quicker and quicker. And of course, tires drop off, as you know. But still, with dropping off tires, Kimi kept continuing, being quicker, quicker, quicker. Very impressive. That was also the Australian Grand Prix 2000, almost the first time we met together with Bert Sender in, in Karl-Heinz Zimmermann's famous hospitality place. Schnapps. And, uh, and, and, yeah, and then the year after, Kimi came to us and Mika retired. How much of a risk was it for you to take Kimi Raikkonen in 2002? Who else were you talking to? Did Hakkonen have any role in, in Kimi coming to the team? The bigger risk, honestly, was for the Sauber team, for Peter Sauber. That was brave. I think Kimi did only, you know, that better 23 or 30 formula races in a Formula car and then jumping into a Formula 1 car. I mean, today, this would not be possible at all because you, have, you, you will not have the right license. But after having seen Kimi in, the, in 2001, so the big step, the big risk was really the Sauber team and Peter Sauber. And having said that, I think uh, the Sauber team and Peter Sauber always had a good feeling for young talent, but for young drivers who were capable of getting the job done. And uh, Kimi was certainly a brilliant example. And I mean, again, if who would have imagined that uh, Kimi starts in 2001 and, and is in 221, uh, he's still there. And still, uh, yeah, I think compared to his teammate, he needs not to hide. So he's still very competitive. Was Kimi difficult to manage in any way? I mean, he's notorious for having a quick sleep before <laughs> before a qualifying or before race. Uh, you know, Kimi, Kimi is Kimi is special, but I, I really love the guy and still do. And I mean, you know, I, I'm very, very rarely I come to a racetrack right now once a year. 
And last year, not at all. But, you know, he still, if, if I see him around the corner, he still has the same smile on his face. And he's, he's, fant- he's a fantastic guy. I mean, and, you know, when, when uh, only one, one story from Kimi, uh, when, when he, he was at one stage, he was in, in Monaco. And, you know, that always this radio check, there's a, everything is very precise, radio check, radio check. And then uh, Steve Helen was saying, Kimi, radio check, radio check. This is radio check, whatever. And uh, Kimi normally answered only putting the microphone, opening the microphone. And then, I mean, every driver explained, yes, I can hear you loud and clearly was the normal answer. Kimi pushed the button and, and you heard, wah, 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 wah. so it was, it was the answer. And then at one stage, I think uh, Steve again said, uh, Kimi, you need to push, you need to push. If you want to win this race, you need to push. And later on, we, 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 we won indeed. And he was, uh, he was at the Casino Square or whatever, uh, Hotel Paris, Casino Square, you know, the right hand. Uh, and then okay, again, this was the first time at the weekend, I think Kimi spoke on the, on the microphone. He pushed the microphone and he said, what do uh, you think I'm doing here? So that was the podcast at that, that time, but um, I, I hope Kimi uh, is not mad about me if I tell that, but this is, it was so, so good and so, and so funny and a uh, really great character. And well, uh, we had a great relationship all the time. While we're talking about Kimi, I look at 2005 as the one that got away, both for him and for you. Do you see it like that? Absolutely. Well, there are, there are more than that, but 2005 was particularly bad. Particularly, yeah. You won 10 races that year, yet no world championship. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, we, we, we struggled at the beginning, but from 14 races, we won 10 and still not winning. You know, again, this is was like two, uh, 2000, 2007 was... Yeah, two years later, same stuff again. Yeah, well, it is what it is. You get what you deserve. And uh, I think even the, the explanation we should have is wrong. We did not. If you sit in the middle of it and you feel, of course, responsible, even if you are not the technical guy, whatever. I mean, I think it's rarely to imagine a pain that comes close to that. And then you say... To that, then you say Sunday evening, well, you cannot win this race. Let's look forward. And then you speak to yourself, into yourself, say, yeah, come on, come on, come on. Then you think, well, okay, I've got it under control. And then whatever, Tuesday morning, you feel, oh, my God, why did that happen? Oh, this is so hurtful. And then really, it is like, yeah, I mean, you feel pain in the stomach. And I think... If you do not have that, then, I mean, you need to have the, the absolute passion. And there are such a lot of passionate guys in Formula One. You keep mentioning Lewis Hamilton. And I wanted to ask you about his early career, because everybody credits Ron Dennis for picking up Lewis when he was 13. And Lewis is always very quick to credit Mercedes, saying, I've always had a Mercedes engine all of my career. How involved were you way back when Lewis was still karting? Well, I think the run, of course, was the first guy, or he was approached by Lewis, you know. And I think, ask Lewis, he will tell you the truth. He was a young guy, and Ron said to me, I think it was actually the oldest board award. Look at this young guy. I remember pictures of him, Gary Peffert in black tie. I mean, you will find it in the archive. This is, this is amazing. And, and, you know, when Mika had his first celebration for the first world championship in the Mercedes Museum in Unterturkheim, the, a certain Lewis Hamilton was on the guest list, being whatever, 13 years old or 14 years, 13 years old, I think. And uh, he was supported by, uh, we, we paid half. I'm not so sure whether, whether in the first negotiation Ron told Lewis we pay half and half Mercedes. And I, I'm not so sure. But I made sure that Lewis uh, learned that later on. And we had this, yeah, in the, in the, in the hindsight, famous junior team, uh, Horseback Hamilton. Uh, again, Tom, if you would have that in a Hollywood movie, you know, in the year 2000, they raced together in the cards called MBM. MBM team was Mercedes-Benz, McLaren. How do we call it? Ross said, well, let's call it MBM. And we shared the cost. And, and really, it was 50-50. And uh, whatever, 12, 13 years later, 
they were battling like crazy on a Formula One. I mean, this is Hollywood stuff, but it was it was the truth, yeah. In a Mercedes car as well, in Formula One. Yeah, and no, no, no. again, Lewis had, you know, all the cars that he could race with Mercedes engines. A GP2 car, you cannot race with a Mercedes engine at that time uh, because this was a, a spec engine. But the Formula 3 car was a Mercedes engine. Uh, the Formula Renault is, of course, not a Mercedes engine, but all his Formula One victories are Mercedes engines. Being member of the family for such a long period of time is, of course, very special. And, and again, you know, Mika's first victory uh, world championship title and, and Lewis being on board. I mean, I still have a guest list from, from then. So this is really something very special. Something very special indeed. And I hope Norbert keeps that list very safe and away from prying eyes, which is something we can help you do when it comes to your private data. Don't get caught out using incognito mode, thinking that will help keep your data and online activity hidden. Because if you're anything like me and find yourself needing to log on to use Wi-Fi at a coffee shop or shared workspace, you might not be aware that your activity could still be logged by the admin of that network. That's why I recommend you use the ExpressVPN app. It encrypts all of your network data and reroutes it through a network of secure servers so that your private online activity stays private with literally the click of one button. It's that simple and it works on all devices. So why haven't you done it yet? Stop letting strangers invade your online privacy. Protect yourself at expressvpn.com grid. Use my link at expressvpn.com slash grid to get three extra months free. That's expressvpn.com slash grid to learn more. Norbert, can we look at 2007? You've made a few references already to the Chinese Grand Prix. And did you expect Lewis to be as competitive as he was from the get go in 2007? I mean, we expected him to be strong. Of course, we knew what he did in Formula 3. Of course, we knew how competitive he was in GP2. There was one very special GP2 race in Turkey in in, uh, 2006, remember, when he had any problems in qualifying, I don't know, but started like 18th or so and uh, came up. And and I think think he finally won or was... uh, He was battling with Timo Glock. And Timo was really, really, really strong. And again, the same Timo Clock, who was then in 2008, the deciding factor in the last race. And I mean, as you know, it was not Timo's fault, of course, because he was just naked with his tires in, in his conditions. But Lewis was very strong in GP2. And I personally expected him that, that he is strong. I think it would be wrong to say I knew from the beginning he would be as fast as uh, Fernando Alonso. Again, what I mentioned before, somebody who's telling you that is just wrong. Well, in hindsight, I could tell right now, well, I knew it from uh, blah, blah. I had a feeling he gets a uh, podium each and every time. I mean, that's, that's easy in hindsight, but we all expected him to be, to be good and to be strong. And to be a very, very quick learner, which he was. And so he's paired that season with double world champion Fernando Alonso, who I don't think did expect him to get up to speed as fast as, as he did. How do you reflect on that driver pairing, first of all? Do you think that Alonso Hamilton was the fastest pairing you guys ever had? Well, we could have more achieved, that's for sure. I mean, we could have done easily without it. Hungary saga in qualifying, remember. This was one of the... Re- I mean, we had several reasons why to miss this championship with both drivers. And I mean, we got punished because both drivers missed one point at the end. Again, if you if you write that down in the Hollywood movie, they say, forget it, nobody will believe that. But I expected... We had a good car. We had... Uh, yeah, I expected them to be strong. And, and in fairness to Fernando, if you have two world championships under your belt, 2005, 2006, and you come to a team that looks like the winning team or one of the winning teams, then you are not expecting uh, there is a newcomer coming, uh, blowing my socks off. I mean, Lewis did not blow his socks off, but it was a level playing field between them. And remember uh, races like Indianapolis in that year, how they battled on the straightaway uh, start and finish line. I mean, in the pits, it was entertaining for you guys, but uh, in the in the pits or at, uh, at the pit wall, it was really breathtaking. But 
it was a very special form of high level entertainment i think and uh, well we could have made more out of it and i mean today i i do not suffer but as i i suffered a lot at that time that we you know no, normally you should beat your competitors you should not beat yourself and beating yourself this is a lesson i learned as well that hurts a thousand times as much if you stand in your own way but you cannot avoid it sometimes was it very stressful being around those two guys from particularly from mid-season onwards? Not really. I mean, there was a period of time, of course, there was not lot, lots of talking uh, between the drivers, but I think we we balanced it quite quite well. Of course, we got a lot of criticism in Hungary. I was in the middle of the press conference afterwards, trying to explain what's going on but try to explain something that is not explainable. I remember that press conference in Hungary vividly. And even now I look back and think, you must have been a team under siege. Did that, is that what it felt like, that you were under siege and the media was relentless in their questioning? We turned it around very often. I mean, we, we sometimes Ron did the, the press briefing, sometimes I did. And I, this was not my purpose, but I think it was my turn in Hungary I mean, I looked like an idiot, of course. How can you explain things like that? I mean, certainly not our best uh, qualifying experience, but uh, very remarkable indeed. How did you you personally find Fernando Alonso? Did you have a good relationship with him? A ferociously intelligent man. At the beginning, yes, but I think he could have made more out of it. He could, have, And I think deep in him, Saf, he knew that he could have got the 2007 World Championship as well. But anyway, it is what it is. And it did not fit together in the in the best possible way. And that's why we, we found a solution. I mean, it was basically planned plan to do more than one year together. But it is what it is. And I think we still have a lot of respect in front of each other. And this is this is part of Formula 1. You know, it's, it's, it's tough, tough, tough business. And... Uh, Ron always said, don't go in the kitchen if it's too hot for you. Seasons don't get much tougher than 2007 because obviously throw it forward from Hungary, Spygate happens. and Was there any danger of Mercedes pulling out of Formula One as a result of Spygate? Not really. I mean, this Spygate was exaggerated. We did not get a tenth of a second out of it. This was a deal between two technical guys. And I think, honestly, as well, uh, we are kind of a, of a fight between Max and, 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 uh, and Ron, whatever. But honestly, Mercedes are certainly, and McLaren as well, we are not cheaters. Uh, we did not get any benefit out of that. But I think, and this is this speaks also for Daimler, for the brand Mercedes, yeah, if the going gets tough, the tough get going. I mean, we would not let a partner down in difficult circumstances that, uh, you know, the guys did not come to me, clap on my shoulders and say, this was a splendid idea, Mr. Norbert, that is clear. But I could explain what was going on. And, you know, it, it, this was not in our hands. We did not say to Mr. X, get this material or blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a different case with Renault and Flavio, couple of weeks or months or whatever later got handled completely different and you know uh, the pk crash in singapore later on that was a different a different issue you know but anyway we did not like it yes i did not like it i, I do not want to go to any court my way of doing things and and being active in the sport and in the private life is not fighting court cases but being strong being fair being clear. And I think that was a very, very good guidance for me. I did not have any any other law cases uh, in 22 years, not with a sponsor, not with anything. Uh, not because we always say yes to everything, but obviously we did a clear job. And I, I do not want to blame McLaren for this as, as my case, really, because I don't honestly think that it was in, in other hands than the, than the acting people. Do you miss the politics in Formula One? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, absolutely not. I, I miss some good uh, Bernie Eccleston humor. Uh, also, Bernie Eccleston speaking to the media after the meetings, the various meetings, lots of meetings. Remember, he said, so what was the decision today? And Bernie said, no decision. What? No decision. We didn't agree on anything, even not on the... 
on the next meeting. We did not agree. So, yeah, fiercely competitive guys, you know, this is, this is normal. But still, I have to say, such a, such a great group of people. I mean, they are hugely competitive, but I think still they stick together. I mean, honestly, if, if I would come to a paddock today, lots of people are still there and, and lots of competitors. And they all, this is, this is really like, I mean, it's, a, it's a, probably a wild or strange family, but a, a family with character. And, and I mean, out of, out of 10 team bosses, some of them I do not know, but the ones I know, they're all paying respect in front of each other. And, and they, they all have a good relationship. And not, not because I'm such a nice pussycat, but who is member of the family stays member of the family, I think. What was it like being the boss of Mercedes-Benz Motorsport and dealing with Bernie Ecclestone? Well, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of good, good humour, I have to say. And he did not like us. Ron and I at all the stages because we, we very often had a different opinion and we were fighting for the money. And I mean, if somebody is fighting for the money, who Bernie thinks it is his money, you're not his best friend, let's say. But uh, he always had a great deal of respect and he always had a, had a joke or whatever. I was certainly not one of his privileged guys in terms of uh, he's my buddy. But whenever we had to do something to do together, and uh, I mean, of course, Ron as team principal was in the lead, but I was I was very well informed, and very often we did it together. But you know, in our case, everybody did that what his function was, what his destiny was, and the team principal was respected from my side as a team principal. But Ron always discussed with me, "What do you think? What shall we do together with Martin, with Marsh, also with?" Manso Ose, Oshe, uh, great, great, great combination of guys, I have to say. I loved that time. It was really good, really good uh, team friendship. Norbert, you were an instrumental figure in things like FOTA. And then in 2009, the Grand Prix World Championship was being discussed. Just while we're talking about Bernie, how close did we get, really, to a breakaway world championship? Yeah, very, very close, very close. I think it was, this is not a good kept secret why, why it did not happen. But it was a step forward and it was an alternative, let's say. And this is also one reason why, why, why Bernie was not in the Ron Dennis Norbert Haug fan club. Of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we were not breakaway guys, but you know, there were, I think, five, six manufacturers involved at that stage. So and I think uh, it would have been a good alternative, but uh, I think it was Ferrari's decision not to join. And then uh, things went in a different direction. But who knows? I, uh, again, Look what Mercedes made out of it. I mean, we, we, we could cope with it. We changed uh, the approach. We did not throw the money out of the window because we had a very, very good system. Be as successful at you, as you can be. Get a huge share of the from money. Get a good sponsorship deal. And then if you look at the finances, I mean, uh, this is probably, I don't know, but maybe it's five times as much yearly budget as we had. Three times, four times. But 60, 70, 80 percent, whatever, come from partners from the outside. And this is the real deal. And uh, this is what, what the team is doing fantastically. I mean, we are together with Petronas since day one. And uh, again, I think the same applies to Petronas as applies to Mercedes. They do not do that because they want to have even more trophies. They get a, they get a benefit back. You know, this is a very good example Everybody who was working in Formula One is, is you know, also also the, 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 the new CEO, Ola Kalenius, was working in Formula One with us for five years, whatever. The head of, of Audi was uh, Markus Dussmann, was a racer. Hopefully he's still a racer, I don't know. I think he is. He was working in HPP as well. So these are good examples. I mean, this is not a must that you have to do, that you have to be in Formula 1. But guys who, have, who are competitive, who have been uh, quick learners in, in Formula 1, in, in the highest form of motorsport, this is a very, very good learning process. Uh, that I'm, I'm absolutely sure. Talking of races... You most certainly were a racer in the truest sense, in terms of being a racing driver. Am I right in thinking, Norbert, 
second place in the, what was it, 1985 Nürburgring 24 hours. And I think we were, well, one time we, we still, we were 22 and a half hours and then dropping out with a silly, silly mistake. But I had some professional drivers with me, Armin Hane and uh, Jokke, smoking Joe Winglock. And I tell you, that helps if you have quick teammates. Uh, that, that definitely helps. And Karl Mauer also. And, uh, I mean, this were, it's not comparable to, to, to the level of competition now. And uh, today, I mean, if you are now 24 hours no boat drink, this is a sprint race, 24 hours long, really, really high class. But fantastically, this, this was, I mean, in the middle of the 80s, this was close to dying, uh, the, the 24 hours. And I mean, what was developed out of it, a Nürburgring notch life worldwide. I mean, what an image. It's great. It is great. Now, what was your proudest moment in a race car? It was with KK Arctic Rally in Finland. And I caused the traffic jam, yeah, the traffic jam behind me because the young Finns, they were pushing like crazy through the woods. And we were, you know, there was always one minute between the cars and uh, they came so close. And uh, I'm sure I was not that slow, but no chance against these guys. So real proud moments as a driver. I was not that fantastic. I was, I was quite okay, but not, uh, not something that was special and brave. And Well, Norbert, can I tell you something? So back in the day, prior to what was normally the European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. As you know only too well, Mercedes used to take journalists on rides around the Nordschleife. And I was very privileged to be a passenger on several occasions. And we were all tripping over ourselves to get in alongside you because we thought that you were the guy who knew the Nürburgring better than anyone else. And uh, we were going to have the most fun with. No, that was, that was good. And I think that was also, I mean, this was Wolfgang Schuttling and our idea and, you know, having some fun and, and also, well, maybe, maybe scare some of the guys. This is it. This is, this <laughs> yeah, you is did a, that as well. This is a good <laughs> answer on an article as well. But I mean, this was, yeah. they were critical on us, but we still, it was a family. And I think doing things like that. And we, we also looked at the safety to have a rollover bar and, and seat bells and stuff like that. But this was, and, and all, all the English media friends, I remember that very well. And we had an evening before and then the next day, you remember these guys? Yeah, had a hangover the next day, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it was, this was, was good fun. And uh, I think all of the media guys, once they've been uh, around the Nürburgring, not Schleife, because, I mean, we had five cars or whatever and, 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 and drove for four hours, the DTM drivers, all of them. This was really, uh, yeah, very good. Schneider was useful, wasn't he? But Norbert, you have also tested Formula One cars in your time, back in the day when, when you were a journalist for Automotor and Sports. I know that you got in the Williams in the mid-80s. Did you also get in the Renault as well? Yeah, at the very beginning of the 80s in a, in a Renault Turbo, I think 81 when I was in Automotor and Sport. And in the in PKs, Williams, Honda, and Suzuka, I drove once. But, you know, this was kind of a, how do you call it, a track test, but very, very slow. I tell you, if you do not have the right temperature in the tires, you spin so quickly and you just get a little bit of an impression. Uh, that's it. But you cannot name it uh, driving close to competitive lap times. Not at all. I mean, still a Williams Honda FW. 11, I suppose it was, around Suzuka. That's bucket list territory, isn't it? Yeah, well, it was the upper part of the circuit. And really, I mean, I only I only dare to really go for it on the straightaway. There were, there were in the back part of the circuit, isn't it? There are pits as well, you know, after the long left-hander. And uh, I, only, I only tried to, to accelerate a little bit there. So, But it was, it was good to do it. It was... Uh, a great story for Automotor on Sport. It was an anniversary of Honda at that time. And I think generally speaking, if you if you have an idea about the whole thing and if you have your own experience, and I'm not Mr. Mr. Racer and I'm a, I'm the greatest racer in the world, not at all. But having an idea, having a clue certainly helps to understand drivers. So um, were you flat through Degna 1? <laughs> no way, no way, no way. <laughs> I mean, I was close to flat on the straightaway, but I tell you one thing, I think this was a turbo engine with a restricted to four bar. 
but it was it was a, they told me it was a thousand horsepower at that time and the cars were, were not 850 I have no idea you were, do you know that but this, the car was probably 650 kilos even less than that probably yeah, yeah. probably probably even less than that so this was like a yeah, like a cannonball, really. So, and then uh, around Amazing. the corner, flat, no way. I mean, you could commit suicide, no way. Before I grill Norbert on more great racing drivers, there's time for me to remind you that Silverstone's next, giving us a first look at the new dynamic sprint format as well. F1 TV Pro subscribers can stream every track session live and on demand. They can enjoy exclusive features such as the pit lane channel, onboard cameras and the pre-race show, taking you behind the scenes of the Grand Prix weekend. The multi-camera angles, in-depth analysis and real-time data for every session means it really is the best view for fans. And with F1 TV access, the live leaderboards and trackside data allows you to compare driver lap times, making you feel like you've got your very own pit wall. The F1 TV library now boasts more than 1,800 hours of race archives and shows. So if you're feeling nostalgic, they've got you covered. To get all of this and more, simply go to f1tv.com, sign up for your F1 TV subscription and take your race weekend to the next level. It's important that I mention that F1 TV Pro is only available in select territories. So please do check the website for more details. There's one man who we haven't talked about at great length yet, and I would just love to discuss him now, and that's Michael Schumacher, was racing for Mercedes when you joined the company in 1990. Raced for Mercedes, of course, towards the end of your career when you bought Braun Grand Prix. Can you just sum up your relationship with Michael? I know, I know you were very close to him. What sort of a man was he? How competitive was he? Did you ever talk to him about Mick Hacken and that kind of thing? Yeah, sure we did. I mean, we, we, uh, Michael was, I, mean, I knew Michael from uh, when he was a Formula König driver, Formula 3 driver, when I was a journalist. Then he came to Mercedes before I was there. He was already there as a junior. Then he was with us in Group C in 1990. I came at the end of 1990, 91. We had a full season of sports cars. And then he ended, uh, we won the last race in Autobolis, Carl Wendlinger and Michael Schumacher with the C291. Uh, and then the next year, we, in A91 already, we helped Michael to go into this Jordan ride in Spa. And then 92, he was at Benetton. And two years later, he was world champion. Then he came, came, went to Ferrari. As you know, took him five years, by the way, to win the first world championship in the year 2000. And we were, we were fierce competitors, but had always, uh, next to the racetrack in the paddock, we always had a good relationship. And uh, we always had the joke, or, my, or I had to joke, some, someday we need, to do it, we need to do it together sometime. I mean, there were some, some secret negotiations in 98, but uh, it never came together. But then, at the end of the period, in the year 2010, the last three years, we were together with Michael, and it's, a, it's an absolute shame. They had this skiing accident, yeah, because Michael would, Michael would have been a, a great ambassador for this world. I'm sure that he was, you know, he, he is a great manager as well. I mean, he, he was really a, a very, very special guy. Having fun as well as working hard, uh, looking after other people, knowing the names of the mechanics of the mechanic kids and so on. You know, all these stories. But it's 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 a, it's just the truth. I rate him very very highly, and uh, well, great memories. I'm salivating at the thought of a Mika Hakkinen Michael Schumacher pairing in a McLaren Mercedes for 1999. My goodness. That would have been something. Did you get close? You said there were secret negotiations. Yeah, it could. It could. In theory, it could have happened, but it did not come together. But anyway, it is what it is. But yeah, it is not something that was completely impossible because we were really good in 98. 98, this was the, the new Formula 8 year new car. So that was no, attractive for any for any driver and Michael well, I mean Michael could have won a world championship early on you know that he could have won 99 without his accident we could have won 2000 without a, without a failure or whatever but it was a great period it was a great period of time and it was a very intense fight best described uh, via the, the 2000 race in, in Spa the two guys I think if you have asked them 
whom are you rating highest as your competitors? I think both mentioned the other yeah. guy. Yeah, they did. And of course, he came to Mercedes. You got him in the end for 2010, 11 and 12. Didn't win a race. But how much did Michael contribute, do you think, back then to the success that Mercedes is having now? Did he help lay the foundation? Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody will mention that this is uh, Ross is best qualified to do that. And Ross, of course, was instrumental in getting Michael on board. And I was saying to Ross, if some guy can achieve that, okay, to Ross said, you're a friend of uh, of Michael. And I said, but you have been the boss, all the races, all the victories, all the everything, everything is done with you and him together. So let's go and get him. And it worked out. But uh, yeah, it was very, very constructive, very helpful. And, you know, the China race, our first race, when you remember, we were a one-two position and Michael has a, had a wheel nut problem at the pit stop. I mean, he was he was on a good way also being uh, in a position to win the race. And, you know, putting the car on pole in Monaco in the last year, he was criticized, being not so quick anymore. But I see it completely differently. He was out of the car for some time was a different kind of tire when he came back. So you need to make the tire work. And, uh, you know, at that stage, uh, not everybody was discussing the tire window. And, uh, and uh, I mean, but it was certainly a, a difficult issue. Yeah, it's just a shame what happened in December 2013. How excited are you to see what Mick Schumacher can do? I think he has, well, he, he, he certainly has... Uh, a big task ahead of him right now. Hopefully he gets the right support with us. I think he can learn there. I hope uh, Günther Steiner is supporting him in a very good way. I think Günther can do that and uh, he needs to take his time. But uh, also, also Mick was criticized, but look what he did in Formula 3, Formula 2. People may criticize, it took a while, whatever. At the end, uh, he did not get a present in Formula 3, he did not get a present in Formula 2. He showed some Really, really impressive stuff. He showed some overtaking maneuvers. Rarely mistakes I saw here and there, yes. But his overtaking was also very impressive. I'm 100% sure that he has the right surrounding, that he gets advice from Sabine Kane, from Peter Kaiser and the guys. So they know what they're talking about, the level of fitness, the way he speaks English, everything is fine. And I think... Don't expect him to be on a podium or be a regular point scorer. You know that how difficult it is. But expect him, give him peace to learn and to go step by step. And we will see a, a Mick Schumacher going from good to better, I'm sure. And do you think Mick is the key to improving the popularity of Formula One in Germany? Because it seems ridiculous somehow that we've got the biggest ever calendar this year, 23 races, and there's no German Grand Prix. And it seems that the popularity of the sport, tell me if I'm wrong, has dropped and waned since Michael retired. And even with Sebastian Vettel's success, it hasn't been the same. Is Mick the key to the future? Well, it very much depends on uh, on the success at the end of the day. But having the name Schumacher back is just fantastic. Uh, I hope it is not put too much pressure on him. And, uh, you know, if, if I would give him an advice, I'd just say don't care about it and don't read it and don't, don't, don't go into social media, blah, blah, blah. Focus on your job and get the talking on the race back. And, uh, and, and that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Stefano... I mean, he's, he's the right guy. These two, uh, Ross and Stefano, this combination in Formula One right now, they can go forward. And, uh, you know, if there is anything I can support from the background, I, I certainly will do it. My advice would be really to describe the human side as well. There is a very professional, money-driven uh, economic side, but a so-called soft facts in Formula One. I mean, if you can promote them, if you see how people stick together, how a team is working, how everybody helps each other. Being competitors on the racetrack and really helping each other next to the racetrack, this is not a saying, this is existing. And probably the outside world does not know that. And again, this is not a holiday camp, but I think this is such a contrary, so fierce, so tough on the racetrack and so positively moving forward next in. And then, of course, Formula One, I think, is very important. Sends a message, uh, sustainability, uh, 
terms of synthetic fuels and then uh, e fuels, whatever. I think that is important. I mean, this is already uh, in the right direction, but describing that in the right way and then describing the technique in the right way, if you see what such an engine can do, that is, is a I mean, it's an absolute world record, this engine, in terms of fuel consumption, specific fuel consumption, and so on and so on. And this, these are highlights. This is, a, this is a learning era for technical guys, for data analysts, for, I mean, it's much, much more behind Formula One than what you see on the racetrack. That's very well put, Norbert. And of course, the new regulations in 2025 are going to be upon us before we know it. So it's... It's all decisions now. Well, what a fabulous chat. I hope you've yeah, enjoyed. Absolutely. Thank you. I mean, we could continue for hours. <laughs> we could. But I've got one more question. That is, what is your best memory of your time in Formula One? I think, you know, this is a silly answer, but I have lots of, lots of good memories. I have some special ones. I remember their first victory in the new Selva Arrow McLaren in David Coulter, by the way, in, in Australia. This was, this was really something special, but I have lots. Louis' first, first win and, uh, in, in Canada in 2008, uh, Mika, I mean, what Mika achieved all the, all time long. And also, uh, as expressed before, uh, David Coulthard, I rate him very highly. I mean, he's, he's getting 50 now, but he's, he's still so, uh, you know, jokingly, I say this guy is working 720 days a year. He's so active what he does for the uh, interviewing in Formula One television commentator, businessman. And this is really good to see that after your racing career, you are still a racer. And this is what I, what I explained before. Also, Mika, all of these guys are positive, active, lots of fun, I tell you, if you see them in between. And still a, a friendship since whatever, 20 years or longer. I mean, it's the truth, nothing else. Norbert, thank you very much for your time. See you soon at a race, I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Wasn't it great to hear from Norbert again? Even in pre-COVID times, we haven't seen him at racetracks that much in recent years. So it was fantastic to get his thoughts on F1 again. And his comment right at the start about needing a few years to recover from his time in Formula One was, I think, a joke. But then again, it might not have been because he always gave a good party whenever McLaren Mercedes won a race. And the cumulative effect of 78 race-winning schnapps-infused shindigs might indeed have taken their toll. I loved what he had to say about the early years of Mercedes returning to Formula One and the influence of people like Mario Illion and Roger Penske. And his comments on some of the drivers were fascinating as well. His thoughts on Mika Hakkinen were chilling. The way he described his return from the accident in 1995 and the fact that he deserved more wins and titles was a take-home message. And I still can't get the image of Norbert driving a Williams Honda at Suzuka out of my head. That must have been a great crack. Journalists have all the fun, eh? Norbert, it was great to chat. Many thanks for your time. And I hope to see you at a racetrack again soon when the world finally opens up again. Before we move on, please send in any stories or thoughts that you have on Norbert. It doesn't have to be from Formula One. Did you bump into him at a DTM race, for example? Let me know, and remember, I'll read out the best ones next week. Send them to me, at Tom Clarkson F1, or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings me on to what you said about Christian Horner after last week's show. Now, my chats with Christian are always popular, and never more than now, with his team winning regularly once again. Newton Nascimento got in touch with this. Great interview with Christian Horner as usual. I bumped into him back in 2012 in Austin when Red Bull was celebrating the Constructors title. I'm a marshal and was right next to Christian during the podium celebrations and he was very nice and attentive to me. Now, Newton, that's just the insight I'm after when I ask people for their stories about some of our guests. And I can imagine you and Christian stood next to each other for the national anthems at the end of the pit lane in Austin. Just fabulous. Thank you for that. And WH400 had this to say. To spend a day with Christian Horner would be awesome. So well-spoken and pleasant, but you can always feel that tiger beneath the skin doing everything and anything to win. You're spot on there. 
I really felt that too during the interview, especially the bit when Christian said, it's our job to win this year and next year, even with the rule changes that are coming up. Gulp. That's raw ambition right there. And Elliot Hay got in touch with this. You've done it again, he says. Red Bull Racing was the first F1 team I started to support when I was first watching Formula One. I've never met Christian before, but I'd love to meet him someday. Well, Christian, if you're listening, I think Elliot, who has clearly been a Red Bull fan for a long time, needs to visit the team in Milton Keynes. There you are, Elliot. I've tried. And a quick word on all of the forfeits that you've come up with for me. Should Red Bull win the world title this year? For some mad reason, several of you reckon I should recreate the photograph of Christian sat naked on the side of a Formula 3000 car. Really, guys, you don't want to see that. Thus far, the following from Fred Daniel has my vote. He says, just listen to your interview with Christian Horner. Perhaps you should shave his head if Red Bull wins the championship. He's been complaining about going grey. Now, I like where you're going with that, Fred. I think that's got legs, so let's go with that. Well, we'll leave it there, and I'm sorry if I haven't read out your message. Thank you to everyone who sent them in. I've read them all, and I love them. Well, that's it for another week. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Norbert, and remember to send in your thoughts and stories on him. As ever, I'll be back next week with another great guest from the world of Formula One. So see you then. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>